I guess at the time it wasn't quite called Russia, it had a different title, but some people still called Russia. Um, through New Jersey, which we see right there on the uh, relief map, and, uh, he could probably point exactly where it is. And then obviously uh, the great state of California, which we all get to enjoy here this afternoon. Um, we get outside and enjoy and, a little you know, sunshine. Puerto Rico and Arizona in between. That's why I said we don't have enough maps to cover all the geographies that if we had only GPS to and, and we're able to track all of his movements. Actually, I think someone is doing that right now. Yes. Uh, tracking all of his movements. But so Alex comes uh, to San Jose State from UC Santa Cruz where he did his PhD and he's an expert on carbon dynamics in ecosystems largely with a specialization in, in the soil, the stuff that no one really understands or um, has really characterized very well. So he's kind of a, a path breaker in that area of understanding uh, soil root dynamics and how carbon is exchanged between the atmosphere and the roots and all that stuff. Um, and I'm sure I butchered lots of terminology as I get uh, specific Perfect. there. Um, so he also knows a ton about environmental law environmental policy, and that's why he teaches those courses here. So at San Jose State, he teaches courses on climate change, environmental policy, environmental law. Not so, law, economics. I'm sorry, economics. But you, sh you also, I should yes. say, do know a ton about environmental law also. So he is one of these interdisciplinary scholars who's able to take knowledge from the biophysical sciences and apply it to policy and, and legal interpretations and things like that, and vice versa, thinking about the implications of policies and legal law, things like that how it might affect um, the environment. He's done a lot of work on carbon modeling, obviously, trying to understand this. Um, he's done boy, a ton of different things, worked on a, a protocol for how to calculate these things, or whether to calculate these things for carbon offsets through the Climate Action Reserve, which is one of the major um, offset uh, generators, so, so to speak, in, in California, or in the US, I should say. He's been an expert witness at the California Public Utilities Commission, He's a co-PI on a very, very large, multi-million dollar USDA grant focusing on strawberry production systems and life cycle assessment. So we're going to hear a bit about his work today. Um, so let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Gershenson here. Uh, what Dustin didn't mention is that Dustin and I started in the same cohort uh, doing our PhDs. We 2001. Yeah, 2001, uh, and we've been working together since then in various capacities. So, as a matter of fact, the work that I'll be talking about today is none of the above, uh, in a sense. It's a, it was a uh, project that actually um, Dustin did a giant chunk of work on, and also uh, our colleague Ben Tosher did a bunch of work on. And this is work that we worked with the uh, Center for Biological Diversity and Friends of the Earth uh, on. Uh, they came to us and said, listen, there's this thing that nobody knows, uh, and, and can you figure this out for us? And that thing is how much carbon is embedded in fossil fuels that are held by the federal government. So we'll talk about that uh, a little bit. But um, it was a question that nobody really had a good answer for, for a variety of reasons that will become apparent in a little bit. Um, and so we worked this summer to put this together. And then uh, folks at the World Resources Institute, who everybody knows about WRI? No? WRI is one of the premier kind of nonprofit think tanks um, and they have done a bunch of work similar to this. And so they said, we'd like to take a look at it. They, they developed a bunch of the methodologies for calculating these things. So they are they're kind of a uh, think tank that is at the forefront of applying science to policy. So um, before we begin, uh, or before I get to our results, I want to give you guys a quick primer on why this is important and what's going on. Um, and I want to apologize in advance. I'm not feeling my best these days, so I'm a little foggy. So if I lose track of thought, just remind me what I was talking about. Um, so uh, the way that we're going to do this is we're going to talk about a little bit about what are fossil fuels and 
what is the difference between fossil fuels as we think about them and fossil fuels as they actually are? Uh, we're going to talk about life cycle uh, impacts of fossil fuels and what are the things that matter. Uh, we'll talk about what is this federal fossil fuel leasing thing and why are we doing it and how does it work. Um, then we'll jump into uh, some ideas from models of what, how much can we emit. And you've probably heard of 350.org, you've probably heard of the Keep It in the Ground campaign. Well, this is putting some meat on those bones. Um, and then we'll talk about uh, the results of our work and where does that take us. Uh, feel free to interrupt at any point with questions um, because I'd rather move on only when everybody's full. So, uh, you've all seen this, right? These are global CO2 emissions. Um, you can see that uh, we're releasing about uh, 40, today it's probably about 40 gigatons of CO2 per year as a globe. Um, that is up from um, when I started college, which was not that long ago, we were releasing just a little bit over half that amount. So um, since the time that Dustin and I met, which was not that long ago, right, we've gone from 25 to 40 gigatons of CO2 global emissions. So uh, the rate really sped up during the 2000s. Um, you can see the impact of the recession that one year when it <coughs> went down. That's the recession right there. Uh, and it's picked up uh, considerably since then. Um, mostly, although not all, of it is driven by an increase in uh, coal usage, um, specifically in China. Um, but overall, you can see that uh, all fossil fuel uh, use profiles show an annual increase, and it's continuing, and it is not declining. This is again global. Now, this is only up until 2010. Uh, I'm sorry, 2012. So, um, recently, uh, natural gas use has been growing faster, especially in uh, in the United States due to new technologies such as uh, hydraulic fracturing. Um, and in the United States, the use profile looks a little bit different where coal is on a decline and natural gas is on an increase. But China, China's use of coal basically dwarfs um, any sort of changes that happen on the U.S. utility energy markets. And China uses a bit of our... Well, we yes. export coal to yes. China as ours goes down. So, um, I want to focus, this is one of my favorite slides to show ever, because when we think about oil exploration, right, we think about this kind of stuff, right, there will be blood, uh, you've seen that, right, you just dynamite and it just comes out of the ground and you just package it and put it in a pipe, right. The reality is that um, this kind of oil, for instance, in the United States, peaked in 1975 and has been declining since then. In the continental United States, it peaked in the 90s if we, if we add up Alaska to that. Right? And today, uh, oil and gas and coal exploration look very different. Um, for scale, that is a car and that is a DC-9 excavator, right? And this, anybody want to venture a guess where this is? taken? Alberta. Correct. Yeah, these are the tar sands of Alberta. Um, these pools are so toxic that when burns land on them, they frequently die on contact. Uh, and these pools, and these pools are very important. This isn't just rainwater. Basically, you have to wash this stuff to get the petroleum out. Um, frequently, you have to heat it as well. The massive amount of energy and massive amounts of resources go into getting the oil out of this stuff, and these are the pools of that waste, uh, wasted uh, water that washed through the petroleum sand. So, not not very fun stuff. 
Um, and there is an energy cost to this. So uh, this is uh, energy return on investment. So basically, in the 30s, uh, in the United States, if you use one unit of energy, you got 100 units worth of energy worth of oil back. Right? It was easy. You, you blow the thing, and then you just pull it out fast enough. Right? No energy required during exploration. Uh, for, for reference, today, we're at about 17 to 1. So, right, so domestic oil, 1970s was, you know, there was a lot of variation, but it was already substantially smaller than this. Um, you know, tar sands, we're, we're, we're it, it's almost, I've seen estimates as low as 2 to 1. So you only get two units of energy for every unit of energy that you put in. But again, there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, now I want you to note this. Coal, yes, there's a lot of variation, but it is still, the reason why it's so cheap to burn coal for electricity is that, especially the higher grades of coal, you're getting a lot of energy um, out of a fairly small amount of energy that you put in because the way that we mine coal is still blow the top off the mountain and then just dig it out. Um, so uh, this brings me to the idea of the impact of fossil fuels. Right? So clearly there is, there is a, a, a certain amount of energy that goes into getting them out. Right? But that's not the only impact of using fossil fuel. So the first step in any life cycle analysis is figure out what you're looking at. So this is not even on the screen. So figure out the boundaries, right? Where are you, what, what impacts are you going to consider in the footprint of a thing, right? Then you need to figure out, okay, so what is, how much of this thing are we looking at? You have to inventory, and this is, this is what we did, look at all available literature uh, cataloging the amounts of fossil fuels under federal lands. Coal, natural gas, uh, tar sands, uh, shale, offshore, onshore, all of it, right? And um, that information is around, but it took a lot of digging. Um, and then you have to figure out, well, what are the uses? The reason why we need to figure this out is that petroleum, right, when it comes out, it can be used for jet fuel or kerosene or or, or I'll show you, there, there are about a dozen categories, right? Natural gas can be used for transportation or electricity production. Coal can be used for industrial uses or something else. And all of those uses have different CO2 emissions. So for instance, if you're using petroleum to make pavement, asphalt, you, have, you don't have CO2 emissions because you're not burning it, right? It's, solid on the ground. I mean, you have some VOC emissions, but that's a different story. Um, but basically, depending on the use, you know, if all the oil that we pulled out went to pavement, the CO2 impact would be negligible because we're not burning it. Does that make sense? Right, so you have to figure out where, what are the streams of use for the particular research. Then you have to figure out, well, there is uncertainty. Right? And so each one, each stream has a particular uncertainty associated with it. Some of it we know, you know, if it's going into gasoline, into a gasoline engine, um, that's a lot less uncertainty than if, it, than if coal is being used for an industrial process, right? Depending on the industrial process, it could be a lot or a little in that category of industrial process. It encompasses a lot of things, right? So we have to take a look at uncertainty. And then, of course, we need to calculate the impact. Sum it all up. And so the, the, the general idea is that you have, is that the impact is a function of the amount of resource, right? How much is there? Uh, what is it used for? And what percentage of this total amount is used in a particular, uh, for a particular use? Um, so basically you have Every fossil fuel has primary energy, right? That's the total energy that you would get if you just took that barrel of oil and 
burn the whole thing in in place, right? Without refining, without converting, um, and then you have uh, some energy that um, is applied past the primary energy, and then you have um, you know you have to figure out some of it is storing carbon, like pavement, right? So you have to take that. So, just to give you an idea, so these are the five uh, types of fossil fuels that we uh, evaluated in uh, federal fossil fuel holdings. Um, and you can see that different, uh, different types of fossil fuels um, can be used for the same thing. So for instance, tar sands, right? You can make gasoline out of tar sands just as well as from crude oil. Uh, and oil shale. But as you'll see on the next slide, the impacts of that gasoline are very different depending on where it comes from. Right? Because as we talked about, you know, crude oil, uh, the EROI on crude oil is two or three times better than on, say, like, say oil shale. So basically, you have emissions associated with getting the oil from the oil shale that you have to add on top of the emissions from burning the gasoline. Does that make sense? Um, questions at this point? Good. I have one. Um, how can you properly assess um, the amount of emissions if, let's say, uh, the data that's provided has been lied about, like in the incident of VW? Like, how would you properly? It's a great question. So, um, with with uh, stuff like gasoline, it's very hard to lie about things because chemistry will get you. And chemistry is very simple. With VW, the chemistry was simple, but there were things that they did to mess with that chemistry, or rather, not mess with the chemistry, but mess with the computer. You know. But a gallon of gas, if you burn a gallon of gas, it doesn't matter if you do it in a VW or in a Toyota <coughs> or in a whatever, will produce 21 pounds of CO2. That's, we can do the, the stoichiometry and demonstrate that really easily. Right? Yeah, it's a mass balance, it's not measured at the tailpipe. Like you're right. not measuring the CO2 at the tailpipe, you're just saying how much CO2 is that, or how much carbon is embedded in the fuel itself. So yeah. you, don't have, you don't face that particular measurement problem with this, but. Yeah, so, so because we know what you get out of each particular use, the math there is actually fairly straightforward, and you don't actually need to ask anybody to report anything. Um, math and chemistry allow you to circumvent that. Um, how do you quantify uncertainty? Um, you look at the outlying cases, and you you create you know a high, medium, and low ranges for the particular impact factor. So let's take a look. Um, so for instance, let's take a look at just finished motor gasoline. Right? Um, if it's coming from petroleum, obviously you have a much smaller, so this is in, in grams of CO2 equivalent. Have you guys heard that term? Not quite. So you have CO2, right? Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. Um, there are other greenhouse gases that have different potencies relative to CO2. So for instance, methane is 21 times per molecule as potent of a greenhouse gas as CO2. So if we were to convert one ton of methane into CO2 equivalency, how many tons of CO2 do we have? 21. 21. Right? Nitrous oxide is 312. Uh, CFC 12. Right, the stuff that destroys the ozone layer is 15,000. So one ton of CFC-12 has the same greenhouse gas potential as 15,000 tons of CO2. Right. So in order to normalize and not write grams of CO2, grams of methane, grams of nitrous oxide, etc., we convert everything to CO2e so that we have a common metric. So uh, you can see that the uncertainty uh, between between high and low in terms of using something for finished motor gasoline is very small. 
uh, if we look at industrial use of coal, right, the uncertainty in the estimate is quite high because there are so many different types of, you know, whether you're using it for metallurgical coke to make steel, or if you're using it as a feedstock for something else, your CO2 emissions are going to be very different. Right? But you can see that depending on where things are coming from, uh, and this, this is a table just uh, you know, really, really showing you uh, the different products from the various types of, uh, of oil that we extract. Right? Um, you can see a huge difference between using natural gas uh, in a residential capacity to say boil your kettle versus using natural gas for electric power. Anybody want to venture a guess why using natural gas for electric power gives you so much more emissions per uh, megajoule of energy? Is it loss through efficiencies? That's precisely right. You have a lot of transmission losses. You have losses of uh, uh, you know, yeah, you have losses, losses all throughout the electrical generation uh, process. That was an like energy concentration student. Yes, that, yes, yes. Um, so um, it really depends on what you're using this stuff for. Um, so let's talk about where this stuff is. Um, a lot of the oil and gas is offshore. And by the way, from an EROI perspective, is offshore gas, would it have a higher or a lower EROI <coughs> than onshore gas? So you get more energy return oh, on your so no, 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 lower, lower, lower. Yeah. Right. So when you have to go out here and drill in 3,000 feet of ocean, you need to expend a tremendous amount of energy to explore, get, maintain, etc. Clean, um, clean up. Clean up. <laughs> well, yeah. Clean up. Right? And then we have uh, a bunch of federal resources uh, for oil and gas uh, um, in um, kind of the, the empty, beautiful places in the United States. Um, North Slope of Alaska, of course. Um, in terms of coal, uh, most of the federal coal is, again, um, in the Rockies. Um, there is some in the south. But notice that um, a lot of what we think of as coal country is not on this map. Why is that? It's not federal. It's not federal. We have a lot of privately owned fossil fuels in this country. We have a ton of them, right? We're not focusing on them at the moment, um, and I'll we'll talk about why uh, in a little bit. Um, so we have some oil shale uh, and some tar sands. Uh, the vast majority of that stuff is up north. Uh, in, it's in probably Canada. worth just saying, pointing out that oil shale is different than shale oil. Yes, because most of my energy students probably yes. more familiar with shale oil, because we talked about the Bakken shale and, and things like that. So the oil that, you, that we frack for is usually shale oil, which falls under <coughs> conventional yes, petroleum. Yes, which, which is in the orange. And, and uh, oil yeah. shale, is, you do a process called retorting, which is more complicated. But just for you to don't necessarily associate uh, oil shale with, with fracking. Yes. It's not, that's not the technique they get it out of the ground. But anyway. It's just a small packet that I learned when I was doing this project. <laughs> I didn't quite know that before. Yeah. Um, so the federal government, um, much like with timber, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of below-cost timber sales uh, that the Forest Service practiced. And they say they stopped. I don't quite buy it. <laughs> um, the federal government basically leases these resources at below market rates. So it basically creates a gigantic subsidy for the fossil fuel companies where basically they pay a lot less for 
uh, a lease on federal coal than they would on private coal. Um, here are a couple of sources that have tried to analyze this. Um, one of them, uh, this was uh, the Environmental Law Institute, uh, they calculated that, um, and they only looked at offshore oil and gas, right? So they only looked at the orange that is in the ocean. They did not look at any of this, right? And they calculated uh, that it resulted in a $7 billion sub dollar subsidy just between 2002 and 2008. The uh, General Accounting Office, right, that's our government's nonpartisan bean counter office, uh, concluded that, quote, the U.S. federal government receives one of the lowest government takes in the world for these leases, and that the Gulf of Mexico, where most U.S. offshore drilling is located, is a particularly favorable place to invest. I love that. It basically means we give it away for free. Right, uh, coal, a billion dollars in 2011 uh, estimate. Uh, total uh, onshore and offshore to the tune of 2.2 billion dollars a year. Because fossil fuel companies are struggling and they need our money, <laughs> right? Um, and um, President Obama was very proud uh, during the 2008 election, um, I don't know if you guys have remember or no, no, sorry, this was the 2012 election, where he was uh, defending himself against uh, Romney's claim that he has reduced federal fossil fuel leasing, and what he said was, no, I just took away the leases from the folks that weren't developing them and moved them to the folks that will be developing. Right? So President Obama has been instrumental in increasing federal fossil fuel leasing basically throughout the country. So, what's wrong with it? Let's lease it, let's take it out, let's burn it. Right? So, um, I like this graph, it's really complicated, so I'm going to walk you through it slowly. So, um, each one of these lines represents a model run, right? So, climate scientists use models to figure out what happens in the future, um, and no model is perfect, so what you want to do in order to get something concrete is you want to do lots and lots of model runs of lots and lots of different models and get some sort of an average between them um, to see where the numbers converge. So, the black line is the average of a whole bunch of models um, that looked at what is the likelihood, probability, of staying below 2 degrees Celsius, which is bad but not catastrophic uh, for, the, for the planet, given particular emissions. So uh, we have burned um, to date, um, about 1,500 gigatons of CO2 total we've emitted over the last 140 years. So this is additional emissions, right? Cumulative total emissions between 2000 and 2049. So in the next 50 years, how much more can we burn and have a very likely chance, or a likely chance, or, or very unlikely chance, to be below, to end up below two degrees Celsius by 2100. So as you can see, and as you can imagine, the more we burn, the lower the probability that we will stay below two degrees Celsius. Right? This right here uh, is an old scenario from IPCC that is business as usual. So at business as usual, we are not going to say below two degrees Celsius for sure, um, and we will have burned an additional 2,500 gigatons of CO2 worth of fossil fuels. Is that 2011? IPCC? Yeah, yeah. So the scenarios in, in the new IPCC changed. They left the A and B space and went to just watts per meter squared, RCP 2.5, 
say, you know, 2.5 or six and a half and eight or whatever. But it's basically now it's not based on on economic scenarios. It's just based on watts per meter squared because nobody can. Everybody has given up trying to say how we can get there. Um, so um, based on this, where would you say is the break point of 50-50? What is the number for the 50-50 will probably exceed or probably not exceed uh, two degrees? So on the on the y axis, right? Where would we look? The 50/50 chance of exceeding would be found at in the middle. Yeah, 50%, right? <laughs> so it'd be like 17 1600. So if that's here, so then the, this is our range. Right. And now we're looking at uh, here to here. Right. So somewhere around 1,400, 1,500 additional is what we can, as a globe, burn and have a 50-50 chance of being screwed, right? Now, if you want a better chance, then you are traveling more to here. This is where you want to be, right? Um, and here is a here's a different analysis, but that illustrates the same thing. So, cumulative total CO2 emissions from 2000 to 49, and this is just CO2, right? When it says Kyoto gas, it means CO2 plus methane plus NOx plus uh, oh, sulfur, oh, sulfur sulfur <laughs> fluoride plus CFCs, etc. Um, but basically. If you want 20% chance of exceeding two, two, 2 degrees, which is a low, then, you're, then you need to be in additional of 86. If you're cool with a 50% chance, then you're looking at 1437. If you're looking at all total cumulative uh, Kyoto gas emissions, not just CO2, then for the 50% chance you're sticking with, uh, where you're at about 2,000 gigatons of CO2. If you want a lower chance, then you need to stay below 1350. Does that make sense? Yeah. But more, a bit more of a political question. To, I understand the metrics were different, but to what extent does this data match up with the recent release study from ExxonMobil that was done in 1981 that projected this was going to happen? You know, amazingly enough, uh, very closely. Very close. Uh, and it's not just them. So if you look at the very, very first IPCC, 1991, right? This is a while back. The models back then, so today's, today's climate models look at the globe in 50 by 50 kilometer cells, and then have multiple cells for the atmosphere and the ocean. Back then, there were three cells in a model. Land, atmosphere, and ocean. And even with that crude level of modeling, if you look at the projections from the 1991 IPCC's models, they are basically on point with today. Certainly within the range. Um, Did everybody see that 1981 report? I, I, it, it was recent. Yeah, amazed. well, I, I'm, I'm amazed that it got leaked. Yeah, yeah. It's, 30 years ago. Oh, they, I mean, look, we've known about the greenhouse effect for over a hundred years now. Um, we've known that burning fossil fuels releases greenhouse gases for over 50, 60 years now. More, 70. 60. 70. Yeah, for 70 years. None of this is, is new. So I know, I know that it's not my area of expertise, but I know there are, there's some programs overseas in certain countries where they actually pay governments to keep their carbon sequestered. So how does that, is that reflected in the statistical analysis? Is that even figured in? Is yes. it effective? Um, that's a whole course. 
So the answer to that question, I, I'd be happy to talk to you about it, but, but I think Ecuador is one of the countries. There are, I mean, one of the ones I there are There are offset schemes. Uh, some of them are good, some of them are not very good. Some of them are under Kyoto, some of them are outside of Kyoto. Some of them are under RED plus, R-E-D-D plus, uh, which is a most recent attempt at doing something about climate change without having a comprehensive agreement. Uh, my guess is that all of that is going to be wiped away and something new is going to uh, be put in place this December. So all I, I, I am, granted maybe this is just fool's hope, but I think that this December in Paris, uh, which is the next meeting of the uh, UNFCCC, which is the main UN body overseeing um, kind of uh, global level, global, global attempts at, at dealing with climate change, um, we're going to come up with a better, new, more efficient framework uh, that will include everybody. Um, you know, China's on board, which is incredible. They just yeah. announced a whole bunch of stuff. So, the current mess of offsets uh, was the first <laughs> attempt by Kyoto, by the Kyoto Protocol, was designed in 1997 before we had any of the policy indications of how to do it right. Uh, a lot of it was done wrong. Uh, a lot of it uh, encouraged fraud and uh, did not decrease emissions, um, but I think that come Paris this fall, things are going to change. Right. If I could just take another tack at that answer, too. Um, the, with the emissions modeling, they're, they're looking at high probability reserves to take out of the ground, and that's supposed to take into account regulation and economics. So as the government has made passed the policy to keep something in the ground, then that will most likely be subtracted from the overall, but as we'll see, there's such a large supply that it doesn't really affect the, the, right, the scenarios at the end of the day. Yeah. How much of an impact is the, the melting Arctic tundra and all that methane underneath going to have on, on changing where those Do you want to sleep at night? Because <laughs> <laughs> then I won't answer you. Uh, the, the, the long and short of it is uh, it could have an overwhelming effect, uh, and I really hope it doesn't. I really hope that the stuff stays in. It is melting right now. Uh, we do have a lot of CO2 and methane released from uh, tundra soils as we speak. A shell pulled out. So that's um, well, <laughs> that unfortunately that does not won't, won't tip the scale. So in addition to probability, there is another very uncomfortable question for folks uh, around our parts of the world, and that is uh, the question of equity. So uh, in terms of inertia, right, if we take that carbon pie and we look at by current emissions, right, China gets a big slice of that remaining pie, uh, Europe and North America get a big slice of that remaining pie, you know, Asia and the Middle East and Africa get nothing, right? Latin America and India, right? So this is where people live, a lot of people. Uh, but because they're not emitting much right now, they don't get much of the pie. Now, if we think about equity, right? Let's allocate the CO2 emissions by population, the remaining CO2 by just population, not even taking into account prior injustices, right? Let's just allocate it by population, right? So Europe and North America get nothing, right? Um, China still gets a bunch because they've got a lot of people, but uh, India, the Middle East, uh, Latin America um, get the vast majority of that remaining pie because that's where the people are, right? And blended is basically a mix of the three. So this was a paper that came out in Nature Climate Change in 2014. Um, and uh, to look at it per, on a per country basis, right? So equity is by population. That means that United States has to reduce by almost 15% per year, right? And Ethiopia doesn't have to reduce anything because 
they've got anything to reduce. Yeah. They have nothing to reduce. <laughs> Just a quick thought about uh, incentives in terms of population control. What would happen if this were enacted in terms of population control? Would there be national incentives to increase population and retrieve a larger Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I suppose so, but the, I mean, the, the countries that... There's no way the United States... Yeah. If the United States increases population to get a bigger piece of the pie... Um, we would have to increase population by such an amount. I mean, we would have to somehow instantly produce something on the order of 500 million people in order to get to our, anywhere near our fair share without, by without population. Without increasing any energy use at all. Yeah, without increasing emissions, which would be kind of, because it's on a per capita basis, right? So, so if we could do that, if in fact we reduced our per capita emissions enough to allow ourselves to increase our population, it would at least be a wash. It's not very likely. It's a, it's a, I don't see it. It's a, hard, it's a hard thing to do, but, but it's a good question. Yeah. Um, but if you look, so this is the global average per capita emissions, right? So. Basically, anybody that is below this line, the solid squares are going to be below the light squares, right? The light squares are inertia. If you are on this side, then the solid squares are going to be above. So in an equity situation, you're going to have to reduce more than in an inertia situation. Does that make sense? So the wealthier you are, the more you use per capita, right? That would be us. Number one, right. USA. Uh, the bigger the difference between your inertia reductions and your equitable reductions. Um, so, to sum this up, um, multiple different modelers give you uh, different uh, global limits. So the IPCC uh, put a 1560 gigatons of CO2e max limit for to have a 50% chance of not exceeding 2 degrees, right? If, if I sold you a car that had a 50% chance of not exploding, would you take it? <laughs> or would you pay a little bit more for the car that, you know, doesn't have a 50% chance of exploding. Um, and then a couple of papers come in at very similar numbers, around 2,000. And then if we extrapolate this to the US share of that limit, uh, at, at inertia, we get about 356 gigatons of CO2e more <coughs> total quota. Uh, equity is 85. To put this in perspective, again, what are the global annual emissions that we talked about in the very beginning of the lecture? 38, right. So from here on out, under equity, the United States can only burn 85 gigatons of CO2 equivalent total, not per year, total. The globe. So at say 40 gigatons of CO2 a year, how many years of current, at current emissions do we have? You can do this. 40 gigatons of CO2, let's do 2,000. 50 years at current levels of emissions. And of course levels of emissions as you saw are climbing up. So basically the turnaround has to come really, really. Up until now, this was not my research. Let's start with the numbers. This is the result of putting together all of those numbers. So each wedge is a type of fossil fuel. The thin crust is the stuff that is already leased out of that resource. And the darker color is unleased but leasable. Now you remember those numbers of what we are allowed to do? 
to say, do I have a 50% chance? Right? So keep these numbers in mind for, for reference. Mind you, nobody has ever seen these numbers. These numbers did not exist until we put out the report in August. Because the federal government does not track the CO2 emissions associated with the fossil fuels that they lease. So, as you can see, if we just do just the coal, we are basically blowing it. If we do coal and oil shale, we're certainly blowing it. Right? And if we're doing all of it, we're looking at 450 unleased gigatons of CO2e with 42 already under lease, right? So 42 is the sum of all of these crusts. 450 gigatons of CO2e embedded in fossil fuels that the federal government owns and could lease out. And that's just the federal government, right? This is not counting any of the private land fossil fuels. You know that the United States currently is the biggest producer of petroleum in the world? It's not Saudi Arabia, it's not Russia, it's not Mexico, Venezuela, name of oil producing country. It's the United States. We have so much of this stuff that, and this is the, uh, the main figure, Let's take the median. If we were to extract and burn, this is just the median scenario, federal unleased, federal leased, and non-federal fossil fuels, that alone will be 850 gigatons of CO2. Right? Remember, this is our inertia target. This is our equity target. And this gets us halfway, or more than halfway, depending on which model you look at, to a 50% chance of staying below 2 degrees. This made some noise. A whole bunch of articles uh, in a whole bunch of places came out after, um, after we put this out. And this happened just three days ago. Um, 400 environmental groups, you name it, they were there, uh, put together a petition. Right? This is our number. Um, put together a petition to President Obama to end fossil fuel, and new leases for federal fossil fuels. Um, so, I want to wrap up because I'm sure we'll have a lovely discussion. Um, federal fossil fuel leasing takes cash out of our pockets to give it to the poor suffering fossil fuel companies. Right? But it also greatly endangers our chances of our car not exploding. Um, because if we continue leasing this stuff out, it is very economical for the, for the fossil fuel companies to extract because, guess what, we subsidize it, right? So basically they will go for it. They're not going to sit and not take that opportunity. Um, and it will seriously blow us out of the car of what we can and should uh, have the ability to burn. Um, but eliminating just the federal fossil fuel stuff won't get us all the way there because we have to figure out ways, and this is where I'm hoping Terrace will come in. Uh, there are lots of policy approaches to regulating fossil fuel use coming from private land such as carbon taxes, cap and trade policies. Um, renewable energy, subsidies, etc. Uh, but we have to, we can't just, even if we put all the federal fossil fuels off the table, we still, right, so the light gray is the non-federal. Maybe to the inertia of the low, 
uh, in the low range of impact, but but certainly you know just a private, and this is without importing anything, right? This is just our stuff, if, and we also import petroleum, right? So in order for us to meet even the medium quota, we not only have to take this off the table, we also have to drastically reduce the private stuff. Um, not all hope is lost, but if things don't change rapidly, right, we only have 1,500 more to burn, 2,000 maybe, and that's for the 50% chance that your car won't explode, right? Um, so if we don't change things rapidly, we're going to blow through that target and be way out really fast. Um, and last but not least is that science works because by putting these numbers out, right, we, we basically change the terms of the debate and change the, the terms and change the ask of the environmental group. Because there was always the keep it in the ground campaign, but the reason why this research came about is that people said, well, what will that actually do? Nobody knows. Well, now, if you keep it in the ground, now you can say, oh, well, this, is, this will be the impact of keeping this amount of stuff in the ground. And the report has 40 pages of appendices with, with equations for each fossil fuel type and each use of that fossil fuel so that anybody can go and do that math on any resource and see if we don't let it out, what will that mean in terms of avoided CO2 emissions? So, um, yeah. Um, questions? Probably not because Paris works on, it's, it's an international level uh -huh. discussion, right? But what this will hopefully do. So the, the problem with Paris is that lots of countries have done a lot of things. The US has not done anything, right? Have they done studies like this in other countries about their federal lands or government? They don't have that kind of stuff. Okay. Most countries right. do not have federal lands, Got it. right? Yeah. And most countries don't have oil or coal or shale in that kind of a, and the countries that do, don't really care. Um, so, uh, so, but the main thing that this will do, hopefully, is it will light a torch under a certain part of our president's anatomy uh, to, um, to do something because if he goes to Paris without saying, listen, we are committed, and not just on words, but we did this, 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 and this. Oh, and by the way, we also took 450 gigatons of CO2 off the table. Right? Nobody will want to play with him. Because in, in the international law arena, it's like a sandbox. right? So if you've got a kid that is, doesn't want to give anybody any toys, right? nobody wants to play with that kid. So you have to give and take in order to put together an international agreement. And up until now, the U.S., basically, all the other countries said, listen, you talk a good talk, but you haven't done anything. We've already been doing stuff, so we're not going to we're not gonna have an agreement with you until you start putting in something, right? right? This is a, a super useful information to quantify what we're talking about, but I keep coming back to two things. One, the Obama administration has done the opposite, where the goal has been, you know, use American 
energy resources don't import energy. And that's been the really the strongest drive. And it's a political, it's not a, a logical or rational argument. It's a political argument. And I just keep seeing the, going to Dustin's talk last week, the political um, message being so much stronger that we need, we need cheap gas and oil. Which is uh, countervailing, you know, and, 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 and it's the fundamental rejection of the idea that we should be using less gas and oil. And so that's one piece of it, you know, the politics. So if you would just address a little bit the, the politics of actual demand, and then assuming that there's still a huge politics of demand for cheap gas and oil, supposing that the US market were taken off the table, what would what effect would that have on international um, war? and extraction in other countries? So I can't answer all That's of your those next questions, question. right? <laughs> but, but the thing that I want everybody to keep in mind is currently there's 45 gigatons of CO2 you already leased. So it's not like extraction on federal land will stop tomorrow, right? This is a prohibition on new leases. Right? So we have several years of US consumption in just already leased federal lands. That's not counting private lands, out of which a whole bunch is coming out as well. So basically, it does not affect the short term by American energy anything. Or carbon footprint. Or carbon footprint. What it does is it puts a stop to it. And what it will really do, if enacted, is it will increase energy prices for fossil fuel energy. But at this point, I mean, solar is about to, I mean, give it three more years, it'll be on parity with most fossil fuels as it is already for a bunch. So, so I would um, literally love that to be the part of your last slide. I know that I'm rewriting your talk for you, that's whatever. Okay. <laughs> but but if, if the last slide were essentially saying, so why are we talking about this? The point is to, to hold off the, the burners not those burners, but the, the, the or, or those burners, but the ones <laughs> who are, um, who are uh, burning oil long enough for solar and renewables and, and carbon, low carbon technologies to do low R&D. I mean, that would be a, a, that I understand. Thank you. Can, can I try to answer that too real quick? Because I, I happen to have a, a, maybe a different perspective um, than most people on this topic, but I happen to think that climate denialism is an important facet we need to understand and overcome, but I think Americans' feeling of entitlement to cheap energy is actually a larger obstacle. So I think we can convince everybody climate's a problem, but if we tell people the prices are going to go up, it's going to create groundswells of support to Tea Party people out there protesting. So that is like something else that's, that, that no one's looking at right now that I think is really important to address. Um, like so the politics of cheap energy, I think, is so, part so, of it. So actually, the EPA is looking at it. Um, and if you look at it past, and this is a question of boundaries, right? If you put the boundaries on increases in energy costs, that's one thing. But if you put the boundaries to the whole economy, um, climate regulations actually make us money in the long run. And even in the short run, because of uh, reduced mortality, because when you're burning coal, you're not just burning coal, you're killing people with, with uh, you know, 60,000 people a year die prematurely due to coal uh, pollution um, in the US. 60,000 people, right, That's premature amazing. deaths, right? So if we start taking that into account, if we start taking you know, the amount of jobs that renewable energy provides versus fossil fuel energy, um, you actually end up with a benefit to the economy from not using fossil fuels rather than vice versa. Yeah. I don't, I, when we're talking about the politics of, of cheap energy, now I, and we're talking about climate denial, like there's like two camps of climate, climate denial. I think there's the general public, which are sort of lulled into this, this complacency about not really understanding. And then there's the politically savvy climate deniers who are actually deny because they know that this is coming. That I think that, so. I think you give them too much credit. Well, I'm talking about, like, because there's this, my question is, what are the impacts in regard to, like, I mean, Florida just passed a piece of legislation in regard to making a household solar generated power basically legal. Mm -hmm. And there's a push for PG&E to cash in 
more of that. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm saying. Like they, I think there's certain constituencies that know this is coming. They're aware of this, so they want to cash in on 